Hi, Nikki. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to Electronic Music Life <laughs> and Sydney. Thank you for coming. Oh, well, <laughs> thanks for having me. I am really, uh, it's such an honor to have you here today. I, um, I wanted to talk to you about um, when, when, when we we're driving over here today, like we we're, we're talking a bit about the, the state of clubbing today and, I, and the, how the industry now has changed a lot. And I'm, I'm, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on preservation, on how we can keep the culture in its, you know, true form because now it's become such a massive industry and, you know, a $7 billion industry uh, and it seems to be a, like a disconnection from like what, what the culture and, and where, it, you know, where it all came from. And I'd just love to hear what you think about that and, and what are things that could be done today to, to kind of keep the, the, the history alive and, yeah. Wow. It's a, the big question. <laughs> it's a big question. Um, I think one of the biggest problems is that everything is owned by these massive corporations now. And there's such a, like you said, disconnect. There's a disconnect between management and the people who actually come to experience the clubbing experience. And, and I was talking to my friend Spiro just the other day. I mean, little things that no brainers. Okay, at the end of a night, what do they do these days? Lights go up full, get out, right? We never did that back in the day. Never. Ne I would scream at people if they did that. The lights went up gently. I didn't want to shock people. And put on music that was not really conducive to dancing. And people filed out. And it didn't take them much longer than the get out, get out today. But mm. it just happened naturally. And people left with a good feeling. What you're doing is you're creating bad feelings from the moment people get there until the end of the party. Yeah. So you get there, you're not greeted, you're not, no one says thank you for coming. No one says glad to have you here. It's give me your money. How many? Two. Get behind the rope, get behind the rope. <laughs> it's kind of attack the people who are paying for the experience. From start to finish. So first of all, stop the bullshit. These people are paying to come into your venue. Be nice to them. Be like you would at a restaurant. They're so nice at restaurants. <laughs> They're so wonderful. But you go to a dance club and you're treated like a scourge. Mm. Like, we don't want you here. We're just having this because it makes money and screw you. Yeah. It's not that way. Yeah. It's not that way. People love to dance. And if you're going to, what you're doing is you're, the thing that you want to preserve, they're destroying. And it's uh, just those simple things, right? It's, a, yeah. it's so simple. Yeah. It's like a no-brainer. Yeah. Yeah. Why, yeah. why would you push people out at the last moment when that's going to be the memory that they take home with them mm. after a great night, mm. they're going to remember, yeah, but they pushed us out like we were, mm. you know, they mm. didn't want us there another second. And, and then the other thing we talked about was, and, and this was another no brainer, people are coming to dance. So what do these corporations spend their money on? The bar and how it looks. Yeah. And yeah. then as an afterthought, they build this crap sound system. Yeah. Sound was our priority. It was the first thing we addressed and where all the money was spent. I remember we had $10,000 to open the gallery. The sound system was going to cost us seven grand. We got down on our hands and knees and we started that was a nailing, lot of money back then, too. nailing <laughs> in the floors mm -hmm. ourselves. Yeah. I mean, it was that important to us. Yeah. It, we knew that people were coming to hear the sound. And if we had a better sound system than other people, we'd have lines around the block. And that's what happened. Yeah. Um, so it's, there are things that are just no brainers mm -hmm. that I don't understand how they got so far off track when it just seems so simple to me and so obvious. People are coming to hear music, to dance. So that's where you want to put some effort into that mm. 
The other thing is the lighting. There's a real disconnect. There used to be a real coordination between the DJ and the light person. Now it's like a real disconnect, like where the lights are flashing, so many lights are on that when they change one light, you don't even notice it. But back then, we knew that this was theater. We knew it was a presentation. One light, one change makes an impact. Mm. When you've got 10 lights on and you change one, people don't notice that. Mm. So, again, yeah. another small thing. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. Yeah. But right? such a big, big uh, Difference. impact. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Very mm. much so mm. Mm. impactful. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And there's a place in Brooklyn called The Good Room where I play. Yes. And they really get it. They really get it. They understand that, you know, the dance floor is really important. And they spent a lot of money on their sound and that environment. It's Shout and out to crowded. Lauren, <laughs> Lauren Murata, <laughs> um, a down under person. Yeah, that's right, the Lauren. <laughs> um, yeah, like I mean, th what you're describing, these are like real sort of things that are were so important to the fabric of doing the parties, you know. Right. And and but in terms of the big corporation side of things and becoming so such a commercial and profitable industry it seems that that's where, like along the way that 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 that, that essence has has lost it, that got lost in that you know and these these kind of details have been absorbed and well, they they got lost um so i guess it's just going back to basics is what you're saying is like yeah and and management has to wake up they have to under they have to right now i see in in clubs not a person who knows the nightlife in charge of the venue, but a person who does food, food and food services. That's what, who's usually managing these venues. Yeah. Which is another disconnect from the experience. There, now, if you have food, fine. You have a day food manager, and then you have the night manager for the parties. Y you need that person there that knows a nightlife kind of experience. Yes. Yeah. Um, so simple again, and had you know, the experience right. doing that sort of Who thing. you yeah. hire yeah. is really important. Your yeah. staff, your support staff makes the night go well. Yeah. Yeah. How, how's it been for you now, like post COVID? Um, um, you know, we, we were also talking about the love of um, this. Again, it's not just the renaissance, uh, another renaissance of disco and beautiful dance music, but there's this um, post COVID love for guys like yourself i mean you're pretty much one of the the the, the last men standing mm -hmm. from that era the last <laughs> yeah absolutely and but but there seems to be this like um younger generation that's like hungry to learn about the culture and learn about the like the, the lineage and the history and they know all the words to the songs yeah yeah what, what, what do you think that why do you like from your own observation why do you think that's happening for me I'll, I'll tell you what it is for me. Music is a spiritual kind of experience. Yeah. And when a person plays an instrument, they put their heart and soul into that performance. There's a kind of energy that comes through in the performance. When you have a guy in a room pressing a button like this, bing, 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 and that's all, the whole track is just that, and even the bass line is not even a bass, but a tuned tom-tom or a tuned bass drum. It's not even a bass line. There is no energy in the spiritual sense for that track. It doesn't take you there and it doesn't last. All these tracks are like here today, gone tomorrow, but people are still listening to Teddy Pendergrass saying, don't leave me this way. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're still listening to Chaka Khan singing, I'm Every Woman, because there are performances there that people put their heart and soul into, and you can feel it. Mm -hmm. You feel the energy. It's uplifting. Your soul takes a step up with those songs. Today, you don't, I mean, you just, just we Frankie Knuckles used to say plateau. It's like a plateau experience. It takes you so far, but it never takes you all the way. Right, right. Yeah. So, so the it 
I guess after uh, COVID um, and, and being such now people more than ever wanting that, you know, happiness and joy and they're, mm. they're getting that through the music, you know, and, and it seems to be um, what the world wants right now. I'm, you know, I'm writing my memoir, uh, I DJ, and um, it's on patreon.com slash Nikki Siena. <laughs> and uh, people are telling me that it's really coming across the camaraderie, the love, smiles on everyone's faces really was palpable in the early club experience. Mm. And there are a lot of times when I play now, I have that same kind of energy. Like people are all smiling, they're screaming, they're, they're really involved in how the music is making them feel. That has been kind of lost. You know, that kind of, we're not here to just pick someone up or get high on some booze. We're here to kind of share in an energy that will uplift our soul. It's a real spiritual thing. Mm. And people lo lose that. And then it's not really that kind of warmth and love and passion that you can have in this experience. It's, it's again, a simple thing. It's just a matter of how the people at the top are looking at the experience because it's all trickled down. It all, it's all about who, is, who has the intention in the party and is giving it that feeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and in terms of, so I think now people are, um, they're hungry for that because of the state of the world. They and are. so when they, when, when they come to let go and lose themselves on the dance floor, and it just seems like right, right now, people like ourselves working in the music industry, we, we have a, a, a really big purpose right now, you know, to, to, to help people bring all this happiness and joy post COVID. Yeah. Right? yeah. And, and COVID has really gi given a, a smash stop yeah. to the world. And music is a, there isn't a better cure yeah. for this experience. You know, there's something about the end of the 60s, the early 70s, there was every, all the words to the songs and, and the intention, folk music and then dance music became about change, changing things and the new experience, civil rights, the end of the Vietnam War. And it all became very celebratory when the war actually got ended mm. and it looked like the civil rights movement was going to take a big step forward, especially in America. And we have that opportunity here. People are looking for that. Mm. If you just, there are a lot of songs out there that still, even new music, still has a message of hope and love. Mm. And if we kind of, I'm not saying to play a song that you don't like, but if we can get the producers to know that that's the kind of energy we want, I'm sure it'll all fall into place. Mm. If we really have an opportunity right yeah. now to change the world again. Are you finding, I, I've got to ask you now, have you found any artists that of today that kind of give you that sort of sensation? Be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Lizzo. Right on. Okay, cool, man. Yeah. She gives me that feeling. <laughs> yeah, cool. A lot. Yeah. And right. um, I, I really get into her stuff. Yeah. It's really, uh, and it makes me want to dance. And she, um, she's using live instruments. She's using harmonies, all those things that I was watching a thing on Brian Wilson. Very sad, sad. But the music was so complex you know yeah good vibration wow. was, was recorded in four different recording studios and it all came together because that guy is a genius yeah and there are all people now who are doing that yeah but they're minimized by you know a lot of people in the industry who want something fast and cheap yeah 
it's not the way to go. Mm. You mentioned meditation, and and is that, has meditation been part of your life like, yes. for a long time? Huge, yeah. Yes. Even in your early since part of your 80s. career, no, right, no. So since tell me a bit about that. How did you come across that? Like, how did you? Come well, across I got sober right, right, in, right. in like eighty three, mm. and um, in the twelve step programs, there's a thing where you have a spiritual awakening. And um, I certainly didn't want to go back to the Catholic Church because I had bad experiences <laughs> there. And, um, but I was looking for an expression of spirituality. And I started meditating through a book called A Course in Miracles. Oh, beautiful book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, ever since, I've been meditating. And, and is and, there any particular style like, or that you do? Like, um, is it just kind of? You know, Buddhist it's, style, breathe. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's, you know, meditation is listening. It's not talking, you know, it's, it's receiving. Mm. So uh, the objective is really just to clear your mind from chatting. Mm. And if you can get that done, everything else is an experience. Yeah. And it just comes in. Yeah. You'll you'll know it. And when I play records, I'm I get that all the time. Right. I get to that meditative state because I can actually I will have a record in my hand, have a CD or uh, have something all lined up uh, ready to go. Yeah. And people a person will come and ask for that track right. <laughs> that's lined up and ready to go. So we're all hearing this kind of inspiration. Yeah. It's just being open to it. Yeah, I love that. And the only way to be open to it is to quiet the ego, because the ego is going to just <laughs> nah, 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 in your head, and, and that's not what you want. Yeah. You want to hear what, when you silence the ego, you're hearing something much greater. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, um, yeah, I, I think from, um, I guess your your whole DJ experience must have changed, like when, when oh, you yes. started to learn that that to to apply meditation in your life. Oh, yeah. I I remember in the seventies, I in the early seventies, because of my experiences in the Catholic Church, I was in therapy, and very young, I was you know sixteen, seventeen, eighteen years old, and um, I said, I I don't know what happens, but the dance floor just explodes, and she says. What, well, what happens? And, and I say, magic. Magic comes into the room. And she said, you have to learn what that magic is. Right. And it wasn't until 98 when I started playing again, 96, that I realized what that magic is. It's inspiration. It's the higher power working through you. Yeah. That's what brings the element of magic. Yeah. And, 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 that, that's, and that's basically like we, I think we're even from starting early at a young age of, you know, from DJing and, and it's not until later that when you kind of actually realize that the things that you're doing, now you can actually make sense of the right. power of it. Like, oh, that's what, and once you start to understand that, right. that inspiration and that meditation, then you realize I was being, I was doing that before, right? Right, <laughs> and it's and it's not really you. It's like through you. Yes, exactly. It's, yeah, and a lot of times, you know, it's people say, "Well, how?" And it's not me. It's really through me. Mm. I'm just open yeah. to it. Yeah, and I just have prepared my vessel to be open to it. Yeah, and I didn't know that back then. I thought, well, if I mix this drug with this drug <laughs> and that drug, maybe <laughs> it'll. The it'll magic, come together. Yeah, it'll come together. <laughs> it's not something that works all the time. <laughs> Look, I, 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 I well, the one thing I love uh, about the podcast is actually tapping into and talking about things like this a bit more, so that um, people in the music industry get to understand people a bit more about how they do things. And that's right. why I was intrigued to to ask you this question. Um, I, and I also know about your work in helping people with AIDS. I'd mm. love to like, hear more about that and. Like how, is it, are you still doing that kind of work now? No, or? I'm not. But right. in 1983, um, could you hand me that card right there, the IDJ right in front of you? Yeah. This, so this is Great. my was my best friend. His name was David Rodriguez. He was um, 
the love of your life? No. Oh, no, that's not him. He <laughs> was a DJ. Oh, right, right, right. Who, who really helped me in the very beginning to get my feet kind of planted and, and get some confidence in what I was doing. Right. And he died of AIDS in 1983. And it was one of the first people who were very close to me who died. And it made such an impact on me that I started going to these AIDS meetings. And even though I wasn't HIV positive, I just got involved and got sober. So every time I went into a club, I felt uncomfortable. So I figured, let me take a year off. And then all of a sudden, someone offered me a job in working with recovering addicts because I got sober and I started doing it. And it just sort of, when you're ready, the teacher appears, you know, I was, I was ready to accept a, a greater purpose for my life. And I really, in, in 93, I wrote a book called No Time to Wait. And people today tell me, you saved my life because I gave them alternatives to meet up with the triple antiretroviral therapy that came out in 96. And I outlined alternatives that kept people healthy. And it, it really made a difference. Mm. And um, I was, I'm so happy I was there to do that. Yeah, I bet. The, um, and going through, um, I mean, it just must have been such a scary time during that, um, you know, the, the oh, it was yeah, and and just seeing scary yeah. and and feeling very helpless and mm. out of control. It was it was yeah. really a sad time for me. Yeah, I remember going home and just crying. Mm. Just one night, I just came home. Two people had died in our facility that day, and I just I got home and I just I just lost it. Mm. And and. and it took you uh, so somewhat, how many years before being DJing again? Like before you started, like you had, how many years did you have off? What, from nine, from 84 until 96. Wow. So I was at my last job working for a AIDS organization and um, meditating every day. And I heard this voice and I was like, God, I am toast. <laughs> I've had enough of this. And I heard this voice so clearly quit the job. And I was like, no, I can't. I, can't. I need the job right now. Every day, the same thing, quit the job. And just on sheer faith, I gave my two-week notice. On the last day I was supposed to work, Francois Kevorkian called me from New York, because I was living in Virginia at the time, and he said, we give this little party called Body and Soul, which was the most happening party at the time. And he said, and it's Larry LeVan's birthday. Since you started his career, we'd like you to play. And I went and did that one gig, and that started my DJing career up all over again. And, and was, it, was it difficult coming back out, like to start yeah, playing again? Yeah, it was a, it uncomfortable. Was a, it was, there was a mm, few bumps and... and yeah. I had to find my way, you know, but um, I did. But fans were excited. Yes. Yeah. Very excited. Awesome. awesome. I mean, that, that night at Larry's party, it was yeah. packed. And where was that held? Um, that was at a place called Vinyl in Manhattan. Right. And that was Hubert Street. 1986. Six. Wow. Right. Wow. Well, look, I'm I'm happy that you started DJing again, oh, well, thanks. <laughs> and um, and I'm happy that you're here, and and it's such an honor to be able to uh, make this event happen in such short window. And, yeah, 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 it I'm, really it, was. Yeah. Thank you so much for all your hard work. <laughs> I really you. appreciate it. Thank you, thank you for coming out, and um, and hope to see you back in Australia again. Okay, and I'll definitely see you in New York. <laughs> oh, great, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> That'll be nice. Thank you. Okay, ciao. Bye bye.